Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Therefore, as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of the Messiah and also a participant in the glory about to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but freely according to God's will, not for the money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you younger men, be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, because he cares about you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, keep your Bibles open there, though I will have a, a translation up here on the overhead, and uh, I've done that in order to pull apart uh, a passage which I thought was really quite simple, but actually has so many layers of depth. I don't ever believe that Peter is just a fisherman. Uh, it's an unbelievable book. Uh, you've got an outline there in your newsletters and uh, an opportunity for questions at the end, God willing. Uh, God's mob have a new identity. Uh, they've been adopted into God's family. They now call God Father. They've been given new life and a living hope that will not perish. God's mob have a new job. They are to proclaim the praises of the one who called them out of darkness into his wonderful light. Our memory verse, God's mob are to go around the world saying, hey, look how good and enough Jesus and God are. Look how good they are. How sufficient they are. Uh, God's mob are to practice this proclamation. Uh, their practice is the daily evidence of how authentic this good news is. How authentic it is that God and Jesus are good and enough. And that's going to make God's mob stand out. They're going to look really odd in this world. They're described as aliens, temporary residents, refugees. And as we heard last week, that proclamation and practice will lead inevitably to persecution from slander and rumours through to active violence. In all of this, they're experiencing nothing more and nothing less than Jesus did, the one who is the shepherd and guardian of their souls. So, Coming to the end of a letter like this, how are God's mob going to navigate this? How are they going to approach these new jobs, lives and persecutions? Well, in answering those questions, Peter wants to say leadership matters. Leadership matters. That's actually not a new answer amongst God's people. One of the things that struck me this week uh, it, it, when you go to Bible college, don't let things like this strike you 15 years after you finished. One of the things that struck me this week is God's design is for his people always to have a leader. In fact, there is one book in the Bible where they don't have a leader. That's the book of Judges. And things go really pear-shaped. God's design is always for his people to have a leader. But what type of leadership? And how is the mob to deal with that? What type of leadership and what's the mob mentality? Well, Peter wants God's mob to know, and here I'm telling you where we're going to end up, Peter wants God's mob to know that they need theological leadership. Theological leadership so that they can practice the proclamation and navigate the persecution. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you uh, for already having, uh, having heard it read and explained uh, thank you that you are living and active and so is your word. Father, as we think about leadership here today, we give thanks for the chief shepherd, for Jesus, and the way in which all leadership needs to point to him in your revelation alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Map point two on the outline, uh, I, it's not often I say this, but I think our pew Bibles aren't really that helpful when it comes to verse one. 
Uh, our Pew Bibles leave out a really important word. In fact, from what I can work out, about 90% of the translations do. Uh, it's the key word underlined there on the overhead, therefore. Therefore. Uh, it's such a crucial word, and it's, it's there in the Greek. It's such a crucial word because it establishes the link between what we heard last week and why we need leadership. Uh, if there is no therefore, the connection between what we heard last week and leadership is really puzzling. As Peter writes to his readers scattered throughout modern-day Turkey, God's mob, uh, he wants to say to them, leadership matters. Leadership is really important. Let me remind you of that, Peter is saying, as you navigate the world. Uh, And it begins a little earlier in chapter 4, verse 17. So if you've got your Bibles there, look at chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. Uh, And if it begins with us... What will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? Uh, Peter is referring to a verse way back in the Old Testament, a a, a verse spoken by a man called Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel was a prophet. Uh, Ezekiel had gone into exile with God's mob because they hadn't proclaimed and practiced the truth about God. They'd been taken away to a country called Babylon. They're there in exile by the waters of Babylon. We wept. And during that time, Ezekiel is given a vision, taken back to Jerusalem by God so he can see why God's people are in exile. Uh, When they go back to Jerusalem, God gives him a tour of the temple. Remember the temple? That's that big symbol that God wants to hang out with his mob. Uh, As they go into the temple, they see the leadership, and the leadership is appalling. The leadership is appalling. Uh, If you open open Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 6, God pronounces judgment. And he says to his angels, go throughout the city and destroy anyone who is not faithful to me. And I want you to begin at the top. You're going to start with the elders. That's literally the word, the same word as we've got here. And so the judgment of God's people starts with the leadership with the elders. And as Peter refers to this, he's reminding God's mob of how important it is to have right leadership. How important. Therefore, therefore, and Peter speaks to the elders. These are the leaders of God's mob in a particular place. They lead God's mob through the preaching and teaching of the good news about Jesus. You meet them in Acts chapter 20 when Paul gathers the leaders from the Ephesian church and he stands with them and he talks about their job. Uh, The job there is very clear in Acts 20, feed sheep and shoot wolves and your tool is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 1, remember we talked about this in 2021? Titus chapter 1, we're told the attributes for an elder. And we're told that one of the key attributes is teaching the good news about Jesus so that the mob is fed. So back in 2021, the way I described it was similar to the way Kim described it. Uh, It's the vicar and the ministry staff that you pay to do no other job except to do this job. As Peter speaks to the elders... There's something even more personal than a shared history, a kind of community history. Look there in verse 1 of chapter 5. You can follow up here. Therefore, as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of the Messiah and also a participant in the glory about to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you. Peter's laying out his credentials, but if you think really hard about what he's saying here, he's actually exposing his own personal history, isn't he? And just look at the three ways he describes himself. Peter is a fellow elder. Remember what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18? Peter had just confessed that Jesus is the saviour of the world and Jesus looks at him and says, on you and that proclamation, I'm going to build my church. Peter, you're an elder. You're involved in building up God's mob through the proclaiming and teaching of Jesus. Peter is a witness to the sufferings of the Messiah. 
Peter was with Jesus throughout his three years of public ministry. He saw how he was treated. He saw how he was rejected by his own mob. Peter was there when he saw Jesus arrested. Peter was there, well, we don't know actually if Peter was there when Jesus was crucified. And here we see the depth of Peter's emotion, don't we? Because what did Peter do just before Jesus was crucified? I don't know the black. I don't know him. I don't know Jesus three times at the moment of Jesus' greatest need. His right-hand man said, I don't know him. That's why when we had that second reading that Ros brought us from John chapter 21, it's so memorable and we're meant to experience the emotions because at the moment when Jesus suffered, Peter denied him and now he experiences the restoration that those sufferings bring. You can hear the fire, can't you? You can feel the sand and you can smell the fish and they're standing on that beach as the sun comes up and Jesus restores Peter through the sufferings that Jesus has experienced for Peter. Shepherd my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Peter experiences the restoration of true leadership, doesn't he? He experiences the grace of the shepherd who dies for the sheep. He knows what leadership is like because as a broken sheep, he's been restored by the broken shepherd, hasn't he? Peter is a participant in the glory about to be revealed. He's already faced that glory, hasn't he? Remember Matthew 17 where Jesus goes up on a hill and takes Peter, James and John and They see the Son of God revealed in human flesh in all his glory. That's a foretaste of the significance that they'll see on the last day. He's already a participant in it. When when you realise that backstory behind verse 1, you see the emotion, don't you? And the tenderness and the gentleness and the restoration and the wonder. And so because of that, He then turns to talk to the elders. And when he does set out a command for the elders, do you know he's not setting up a template for how you choose an elder or what a team looks like or whether it's one or more or less. or He's not actually even establishing the personal characteristics. That's done in other parts of God's word. He's not even saying you need elders. That's just assumed right throughout God's word that it's a necessity. And there's not even a job description here, but it's implied. What Peter is actually doing is talking about the type of eldership. How how will the elders conduct themselves? What will they be like as they lead God's mob in proclaiming and practising in persecution? When he does that, there's a marvellous personal touch, isn't there? His backstory. But there's also the hard edge of history. Judgment will start with the elders. And so, therefore, the eldership needs to be straight. I'm at point three on the outline. The command is quite clear. It's there in the bold yellow. I don't think I could put any more things around it. I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you. The imagery is clear. Everyone knew what we were talking about when Kim held up that picture, didn't they? We know what a shepherd is. We know what sheep are like. It's an imagery that has a rich history in God's word, not just in the livelihood. Think about how many times Abraham and Jacob and Isaac kick sheep around, not just in livelihood but also in the Old Testament descriptions of leadership. In Psalms, the imagery is rich. If I just say Psalm 23, everyone says the Lord is mine. In the prophets it's there too. Places like Ezekiel 34 where God says, I'm actually going to replace that eldership, that eldership that feeds on the sheep with an eldership that feeds the sheep. There will be a day, one day, when there will be a true leader from the line of David who will feed my sheep. It goes through to Isaiah 53 where we actually see that that ideal shepherd will die like one of the sheep where the shepherd is identified with the mob that he is leading and he dies for them all. And we understand that shepherds shepherd sheep for their benefit, for the good of the sheep. When we open Psalm 23, 
the Lord is my shepherd. And what does that Lord do? Green pastures, quiet waters, right paths. Not for the benefit of the shepherd, but for the benefit of the mob, so that the sheep are fed, protected, nourished, grown, and the wolves kept at bay. The, the leadership of God's mob is shepherd leadership. Shepherd leadership. Now, we've got to get some parameters straight uh, as we look at this, and some of this will get unfolded over the next few minutes, but who do the sheep belong to? Well, they belong to God. Do you, do you notice that there in verse 2? Whose flock is it? It's God's flock. In fact, as we'll see in a moment, the sheep are entrusted to the shepherd. The shepherd himself is one of the sheep. By the time we get to the end of verse 3, you will see that there is a clear recognition that the shepherd is in desperate need of the chief shepherd, of forgiveness, of having themselves cleansed because of the chief shepherd, Jesus and there is a chief shepherd over all the shepherds. It's the same shepherd who is the guardian and protector of their souls. Of all the sheep, his name is Jesus. And time and time again, we've seen that he's the template for how God's mob and live. So what does this shepherd leadership look like? If that's the command, what does it look like? Well, Peter unpacks it in a series of pairs. Not but, not but, not but. And as he does this, he contrasts. But shepherd leadership, first and foremost, is overseen. Every time we see elders in God's word, every time shepherds are talked about, they have oversight over the whole mob. That's their job. Oversight over the whole Not just an in-group and then there's an out-group. Not just people they like or people that are like them or sheep that act like the way they're meant to act, but the whole mob. Oversight over the whole mob. And then he unpacks what that oversight looks like in those three pairs. The oversight is freely and according to God's will, not out of compulsion. Do you see that there in the first one? Not overseeing out of compulsion, but freely according to God's will. Simply put, the oversight is by the revealed word of God. Not by the latest social trends. Not by business management techniques not by economic principles or influencer strategies. It's theological. From God's revealed will. And such oversight is cheerfully done, not out of whinging or complaint or by obligation. Second, not for money but eagerly. The oversight is excited and joyful and eager. Not for financial consideration. Simply put, the oversight is a delight. A delight that is eagerly and willingly taken on. Uh, not motivated by pragmatic or monetary motivations. I've got to put food on the table. I couldn't get any other job. Thirdly, the oversight is to set an example for God's mob. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Examples of proclaiming and practicing. Examples of rejoicing in persecution. Such eldership is not a means of self-promotion, not a way to bolster a faulty self-esteem, not a way to access power that can be used and abused. Put simply, the shepherd proclaims and practices in such a way that the sheep see what following Jesus looks like. It's for their benefit. And such shepherd leadership is framed in what perspective? Well, it's there in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you, the elders, will receive the unfading crown of glory. It'll happen. One day we'll see the significance of shepherd leadership. We'll see it first and foremost when the chief shepherd appears, won't we? How important is shepherd leadership? Well, just look at Jesus, how magnificent he is. And on that day, elders will receive what God has promised. So how is the mob going to respond to that? I'm at point four on the outline. 
What's the mob mentality going to be when we strike such leadership? If you've got your Bibles there or follow along up here, likewise, you younger men, be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, because he cares about you. Peter speaks to one group in particular and then the whole mob, and I think that second part includes the elders. Uh, He speaks to the not elders first. Uh, In almost all the translations, it's translated as younger men. I, I think that's appropriate to a point. Younger men are like bulls at a gate, aren't they? They want to go out and they want to conquer the world. They let anything stand in their way. I think they're elders in training and so they need to think carefully about how to respond to authority. I think a better translation is not elders, which is how this word is translated in other books outside the Bible. We've just talked about elders, so how are not elders meant to deal with those elders? Well, they're very clear there, submitting to their shepherding. Picks up that word that we saw right throughout 1 Peter chapter 2. Remember that word, submit? Submit was used as a way of describing what it looked like to proclaim and practice the nature of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it's described as honourable conduct, respectful, kind, Generous in language and conversation, in behaviour and attitude. Peter then turns to the whole mob and talks to everyone, including the elders, all of you, all of you. Everyone in God's mob are to clothe themselves with humility. It's a command. Humility is an easy word to define, I think. It's having a realistic understanding of who you are before God. A realistic understanding of who you are before God. Who are we? As sheep, we're sinners. As sheep, we're rebellious. As sheep, we're in desperate need of being saved by our shepherd. As sheep, we need to be granted forgiveness we don't deserve by the grace of a shepherd who dies for the sheep and rises from the dead. Humility is knowing that we all, as sheep, stand together equally as sinners, saved by Jesus Christ alone. And we're to recognise that's who we are. God opposes the proud. The essence of sin is pride, isn't it? I'm God and God's not. And God opposes that. And within his people, there is meant to be humility. We're then told what that humility looks like. That's why I've got those arrows there. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. What does it mean to humble yourselves? You ought to cast all your cares upon him. Cast all your cares upon him. There is no care beyond the concern of the shepherd the chief ship, and we're to cast all of us, elders included, cast all of our cares before him to turn him. That's humility, isn't it? Knowing we are dependent on our chief shepherd. Uh, Why can we do that? Well, what's his attitude? It's there in the last line. The shepherd cares about you. How do we know that? Well, there's an empty grave, isn't there? How much does the chief shepherd care about you? He faced death for you and he rose from the dead. The sheep were the enemies, but now they are no longer the enemies. (laughs) The shepherd cares about you. And as God's mob cast all their cares upon the shepherd who cares about them, the chief shepherd, God shows his care by exalting you in due time. There will be a day when we will meet the chief shepherd and he'll say, come to me, my sheep, and live with me forever. He cares for you. So what what type of leadership do God's mob need? 
as they navigate proclamation and practice that leads to persecution? How should God's mob respond to that leadership? On that last point on the outline, you'll see I've got three suggestions there. Three suggestions there. First, God's design is for theological leadership, shepherd leadership. Uh, it, it's fair to say that leadership amongst God's mob has been under the microscope in the last few decades. Uh, we've seen toxic leadership amongst God's mob, a toxic leadership which creates a celebrity culture, a, a culture where the focus is on the shepherd and not the chief shepherd, a, a culture where abuse can happen, a culture where leadership is about the leader. If you, if you want to hear an account for that, listen to the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And just be astounded by toxic leadership. We've also seen pragmatic leadership. Leadership that does what works. That imports into shepherd leadership everything that works in the wider world. Uh, it, it, such pragmatic leadership can work from, I've got to do this job because I've got to put food on the table. It's the only job I can get. Through to deconstructing Christianity because the world wants something else right through into importing business and economic and philosophical and social influencer models from the wider world. And God's model is none of those, is it? What's God's model? Theological leadership. Leadership according to God's will. Such leadership is established in the revelation of God, seen most fully in Jesus Christ. Such leadership is established in the biblical pattern and design Feed sheep, shoot wolves. Such leadership is servant-hearted, desiring the utmost best for the sheep under God that they know and follow and love Jesus. Such leadership is joyful. Such leadership is meant to be humble, knowing that the sheep belong to whom? Not to the shepherd, but to the chief shepherd. Such leadership is what God's mob need now because it points to what is eternally real. Not what is in the shadows, not what mimics our wider world, but what is eternally real. Such theological leadership, secondly, is accountable to God and responsible for the sheep. It's striking that the role of the shepherd is described as accountable to whom? The chief shepherd. When the chief shepherd appears, accountable to God and responsible for the sheep. The under-shepherd, the elder, works under the authority of the chief shepherd. Where will judgment start? It'll start with the elders. The shepherd is not accountable to the sheep, but responsible for them. And that distinction is helpful. For the elder, it's helpful because it means that their life is under constant examination, transparent under the will of God as revealed in his word. Heart, mind, and practice, always accountable to the revealed will of God because the under-shepherd is accountable for how they lead God's sheep. There must be transparency, honesty, clarity about motives, means and methods when it comes to the elders. For the sheep, it means that concept of submission that we heard about earlier on. Submission to theological leadership and what that looks like as a mob mentality. Honourable, not derogatory. Generous, not mean. Kind, not complaining. Encouraging, not tearing down. Submitting, not constantly railing. Proclaiming and practicing the same grace towards the elders as all of us have experienced from the chiefship. Finally, the overall mob mentality is humility. Who are we before God? All of us. We are a bunch of sheep with the chief shepherd who has died for our sins. The elder is not above the sheep, but for the sheep, an example of proclaiming and practising. The sheep are not without a need of a shepherd, not because 
We all fail, but we have a collective need to constantly be pointed to who? To Jesus, our chief shepherd. And as we look at him, we know that he cares for his sheep. To Jesus, the sheep are not the enemy. They are his mob, and he deeply loves them. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, thanks for our chief shepherd. Uh, it's going to be a delight to meet him, uh, to see his scars, uh, to see that lamb who was slain upon the throne, to see the lion of Judah who rules the universe. Father, thank you that right throughout history and into the future until that chief shepherd appears, you've placed under shepherds. Father, make them humble. Equip them to point towards the chief shepherd. And as sheep, clothe us in humility as we look forward to the day when our chief shepherd returns. Father, in all of this, make us such a mob of sheep in Narrabri that people want to meet this chief shepherd. Give us those opportunities this week. Amen. Any questions? Elsie. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. How should you go in a church where the leader is not leading you in the right way? Uh, usually, I, if someone comes to me with that question, I'll ask them three questions. Uh, are they proclaiming God's word faithfully? Uh, are they leading God's mob to know and love Jesus more deeply? Are they keeping wolves at bay? Okay, so what that does is that it helps a bloke like me who might struggle with all peripheral issues think about the key issues because they're the key issues for the sheep and the shepherd. And so if there's a yes, yes, yes to that, then I'll say, well, actually, what's the issue? Okay, is it the leadership or is it X, Y, Z? Uh, it could be anything from um, we don't have signs in the toilets to how we do morning tea to maybe how songs are chosen to the form of the service, all of those things. So if we answer those three questions like that, we know we can stick with that under shepherd. If not, you've got two paths, okay? Matthew chapter 16 helps us think about how to deal with elders who are not doing their job. Uh, talk to them. And notice it says talk to them, not to everyone else about the elder. Talk to them. Uh, if they don't listen, take two or three witnesses, and we're told to have two or three witnesses. And then if that doesn't happen, go to the wider body. If that doesn't happen, hand them over to Jesus. Okay. So there's a really long process here. That could take a couple of years if it's done carefully. If that point is reached and that person, that elder, has not come back to the job described in the Bible, then it might be an opportunity to find another group of sheep being rightly led or to work from within the sheep to bring the elder back to the truth. Does that make sense? Yeah, good question. Any other questions, Elizabeth? So, is it, like you say to us in the church where leadership is being abused, like are you meant to stay until all those processes have happened? Or is it all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. So if you're in a church where... Uh, the eldership is not following the model that God has set out in Peter and Titus and Acts. Uh, how do you work through it? I, for me, I would want to work through that process before making the final decision to jump. Conversely, that could be quite hard, and we're not all made the same, and so there might be pressure there. And one of the things helpful around the submit idea is what we heard with um, with the stuff with political authorities, submit, but that doesn't mean compromise, okay? Um, so I, th I, I think Jesus sets up a really helpful process, and I reckon nine times out of ten, the process works when you just go and sit and chat with the elder, okay? Because that's something we don't often do. Make a time, sit with the elder, and go, actually, listen, I've got some concerns. Can we, can we chat about this based on what God says? I reckon nine times out of ten, if the elder is someone who is keen to serve Jesus as the chief shepherd, they'll hear, and if it's within the role God's given them, they'll adjust. Here, can I make very clear, I want to say something, something very clear here because it's helpful to know, uh, where is one of our first port of calls in this parish? It's parish council, isn't 
Okay, we've got three wardens. That's Phil Firth, Ali Thompson, Warwick Silla. Go and have a chat with them. If, if it doesn't work there, there is a professional standards director in the diocese and I'll give you their number and you can ring them and you can start a process of accountability if sitting down and chatting is not working and, and that's not carrying through. Does that help a little bit, Elizabeth? Yep, yep. Roz? In your definition of an elder, he only has one job. So then we are not to think of our parish council as elders. No, so pa parish council, uh, Anglicans like to be different, and so parish council came about when Henry VIII was going, what's structural work? Oh, town council's work. So I, I don't think we need to think of our parish council as elders, though we would expect the characteristics of a godly, mature Christian to characterise them, which are very similar to the characteristics of a deacon and elder in Titus. But parish council is not eldership, no. Okay. 